Good evening, welcome to Pan Baptist Chapel for our service for Sunday the 1st of August in the evening. First going out as an audio on Wednesday the 4th. Now I know a number of people were praying for us as um, lots of us were up in Nottingham for a long weekend with young people at the Dreaming the Impossible uh, Festival. Um, we had an amazing time but we're going to share more about that on Sunday morning and at the next um, Sunday evening service as well. So do listen out and look out for that. But tonight we're going to be going back into our series in the book of 1 Corinthians. And David um, Williams is going to be sharing with us. We had Dave Lowen in the morning, so it's a, it's a day of David's. And um, before I hand over to David, let's pray. Almighty God, um, we thank you for your incredible love for us. We thank you for your care for us. We thank you for the way that you want to speak to us and encourage us and grow us in our faith tonight. And God, we pray that as we read this this really major passage in 1 Corinthians 15, that you would speak to us as we hear your word read, and you speak to us through David. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, we're looking at the first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians 15, which I call the Gospel according to St. Paul. When the Apostle Paul first visited Corinth in about 50 AD, he seems to have been at a low ebb, possibly because of the way he'd been hounded out of Philippi, Thessalonica and Berea, and the mixed response to his eloquent message in Athens. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, When I came to you, I came in weakness, with great fear and trembling. I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We're also told in Acts 18 that one night God spoke to Paul in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. I have many people in this city. As a result of that, Paul stayed on in Corinth a year and a half, preaching and teaching. And here in 1 Corinthians 15, we have the irreducible minimum of Paul's gospel. The words that were at the heart of his message, the bedrock of Christianity, the gospel which the Corinthian people had received, by which they were saved, and on which their faith stood. And it had three elements. Firstly, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Secondly, he was buried. And thirdly, he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Paul is particularly concerned to affirm the fact of the resurrection of Jesus. He's writing from Ephesus probably four or five years after his time in Corinth and addressing various problems that he knew had arisen in the church. There were divisions within the church. There was moral laxity and marriage problems. There were problems relating to the pagan worship in the city of Corinth around them and there were problems about impropriety in worship. But now he turns to a doctrinal issue relating to the afterlife. Some members of the Corinthian church did not believe in the resurrection of the body. And Paul begins with the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. This was something that lay at the heart of the Apostles' message, Despite the cynicism and the unbelief with which it was often received, they insisted on preaching it, because it was a reality. They had witnessed it. So now we'll read um, that passage in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11. If you have a, a, ring, a love ringwood New Testament, it's on page 195. And Paul says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, 
most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. Now, no, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. If you can have your Bible or a Bible app open at 1 Corinthians 15 as we look at this passage. First, Paul reminds the Corinthians that what follows is the gospel, the good news by which they were saved and on which their faith stands. In verse 1, he refers to the message that they received. This is the same word that he used in chapter 11, verse 23, when he talked about the Lord's Supper, saying, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. It refers to an established tradition that is passed on by word of mouth from the original eyewitnesses. So Paul's saying, this is something that we've received that's been passed on to us from those who were the original eyewitnesses. We sometimes speak of remembering what we were doing on certain historic events when they occurred. Those of us of a certain age remember exactly what we were doing on November the 22nd, 1964, when the American president, John Kennedy, was assassinated. And yet that was nearly 60 years ago. And Paul is writing only 20 to 25 years after the resurrection of Jesus. This is as close as we can get to the event. And he says, this is the gospel I preach to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Paul is stressing the centrality of this message to their faith. But uh, that last clause um, presents a problem. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. I don't think Paul is saying their salvation is conditional on their works, but their works and ours are evidence of saving faith. The writer Leon Morris says, If men's grip of the gospel is such that they are not really trusting Christ, their belief is groundless and empty. They have not saving faith. Paul himself talks in Philippians about pressing on toward the goal and frequently urges his readers to persevere in their faith. We have to press on. God looks for growth in our Christian faith. That involves commitment to his word, commitment to worship, to prayer and to service. And so Paul begins by reminding his readers of the gospel that he preached to them when he first came to Corinth and the gospel that lay at the heart of all his preaching there. And he begins with this defining statement, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. For Paul, a correct appreciation of the death of Christ is essential. Jesus didn't just die as a heroic example of selflessness. In a sense, it was that, but it was far more. He didn't die by some ghastly mistake, believing he would be spared the cross. He died for our sins. This was Christ, Messiah, God's anointed deliverer, and he died for us. He died as our substitute to pay the penalty for our sins. And it was according to the scriptures, says Paul. Paul is speaking, of course, of the Old Testament scriptures. He didn't have the New Testament uh, as we have it. And as we look through the Old Testament, we have direct and less direct 
uh, statements about the death of Christ. The best known direct statement or prophecy is Isaiah 53, which speaks of the suffering servant of the Lord who would be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Isaiah says the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. And then there's Psalm 22 that describes in such detail the suffering Jesus endured on the cross. It includes the mockery of his enemies, the piercing of his hands and feet, the soldiers gambling for his clothes and the physical agony of crucifixion in the blazing heat. These were things that uh, were in the Old Testament scriptures uh, that were known to the people who crucified Jesus. They were familiar with it. And Jesus could not have engineered those things from the cross. There are also less direct references that nevertheless have a uh, vital uh, bearing on Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Uh, the sacrificing of the Passover lamb and the sprinkling of its blood over the doorposts on the night of the Exodus, or the whole system of Old Testament sacrifices where animals were sacrificed in place of the worshipper. They foreshadowed the once for all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And the second clause in verse 4 is he was buried. All four Gospels record the burial of Jesus, and all four mention the stone that was rolled across the entrance to the tomb. In addition, Mark records how Pilate ascertained that Jesus was already dead before his, uh, releasing his body to be buried. And Matthew records the sealing of the tomb and setting of a guard, and all the precautions they took to avoid any risk of the, uh, of the disciples claiming that Jesus had risen. Some people argue that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, but recovered in the cool of the tomb. Somehow they believe that weakened by being tortured and hanging for hours on the cross with his lifeblood draining away, he recovered and pushed aside that huge stone to escape. Well, I have to say, if you believe that, you have a greater faith than those of us who believe that God raised him from the dead. The one Old Testament passage that refers to his burial is again Isaiah 53, where it says of that suffering servant, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. Burial in a rich man's tomb is an unlikely end for a crucified man, but that is exactly what happened. Instead of being buried with all the felons, Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man. And then the third clause in Paul's Gospel, he says, He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. The resurrection of Jesus was central to Paul's message, and it's crucial to our faith. Later in this chapter, Paul says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Why is the resurrection of Jesus so important? I'll give you five reasons. You may be able to think of more. Perhaps that's your homework tonight. First of all, the resurrection of Jesus completes the saving work of the cross. Paul says in Romans, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. You don't have one without the other. The resurrection also shows God's love for the sinner. John 3.16, so familiar to us all. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And then thirdly, the resurrection proves Jesus' claims. He said repeatedly that he would rise again on the third day. If that didn't happen, everything else he said is suspect. Fourthly, the resurrection proves that death is vanquished. Later in the chapter, Paul says, O oh, death, where is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? 
We can take comfort from this. For many people, the unknown of death is frightening. But for Christians, death has been vanquished and there is hope beyond the grave. And linked to that is the fifth point, that the resurrection of Jesus is the guarantee of our own resurrection. And that is the, uh, the burden of Paul's message as we go on from this passage we're looking at tonight. Paul says once again that it was according to the scriptures that Jesus was raised on the third day. The one passage that the apostles quoted to prove this was Psalm 16 and verse 10, which says, You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. And this was quoted by Peter in his speech at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and also by Paul in one of his earliest recorded sermons described in Acts chapter 13. Paul goes on to list some of the people who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus about 20 years earlier. In verses 5 to 8 he says he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at one time. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. This is interesting because we don't read about all of those appearances in the Gospels. Meanwhile, there are other appearances in the Gospels which Paul doesn't mention. For example, uh, Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene and to the other women who visited the tomb, or his appearance to the two on the road to Emmaus. In the book of Acts, we read that after his death, Jesus appeared to his followers many times over the next 40 days, giving them many convincing proofs that he was alive. So there is so much that we don't really read about that took place in those 40 days, including some of these appearances that Paul mentions here in 1 Corinthians 15. First of all, he mentions Jesus appearing to Cephas or Simon Peter. And we don't read about this encounter, but we do get a, a, a passing reference to it in Luke's account. When the two from Emmaus returned to Jerusalem um, to find the disciples, the disciples said to them, It's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. So why don't we have any account of this appearance to Simon Peter or Cephas? Well, in the story of the crucifixion, Peter had denied Jesus in his hour of need. This encounter would have been a tremendously emotional one, and it was a time for forgiveness and healing, something very personal to Peter. Next, Paul talks about Jesus appearing to the twelve, by which he means the disciples that Jesus had appointed, although, of course, by this time there were only eleven of them. That's fair enough. Sometimes we use a, a term to describe something that's not actually the event. For example, we talk about our Sunday evening service, which at the moment, uh, this one, for example, is going out online on a Wednesday. So we, we do do that. Paul speaks about Jesus appearing to the twelve, and presumably he's talking there about that appearance to the disciples in the upper room on the evening uh, of Resurrection Sunday. He also mentions more than 500 people at one time, and we don't read anything about that in either the Gospels or the Book of Acts. So presumably this is another of those many appearances in that 40-day period. Then Paul says that Jesus appeared to James. Uh, this is interesting because James the disciple, the brother of John, had almost certainly been uh, martyred by the time Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. So this was another James, and it was almost certainly James the brother of Jesus. What's interesting about that? Well, in the Gospels, we read that Jesus' brothers did not believe in him during his earthly ministry. But in the book of Acts, 
James is one of the three most prominent apostles, along with Peter and Paul. So at some stage, Jesus appeared to his brother, James, and as a result of that appearance, James became a devoted follower of Jesus Christ, a witness to his resurrection. Then Paul mentions all the apostles. These are the men who became the leaders in the early church. They included the disciples, but they included some others like James I've just mentioned, or Paul himself. They were people who were defined as having met the risen Christ. And this is presumably one of the other appearances we read about in the Gospels, or maybe a completely different occasion during uh, the 40 days. But finally, Paul mentions himself as being like one abnormally born. The term he uses is one used to describe a miscarriage. Jesus didn't appear to Paul during those 40 years, but as a special appearance later on the Damascus Road. Paul always marvelled at the grace of God. He had not just denied Jesus like Peter, he had actually persecuted Jesus' followers and was having them put in prison and was present when uh, one of them, um, Stephen, was martyred. And yet he was the man God chose to take the message of salvation to the Gentiles. The point about all this for Paul is that there was incontrovertible evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. He's writing 20 to 25 years after the event, so many of the people he mentioned were still around to confirm the fact. Over the years, many people have set about disproving the resurrection and have ended up by believing in Jesus. They include Frank Morrison, who wrote Who Moved the Stone? They include the Chicago Tribune journalist Lee Strobel and an American homicide detective J. Warner Wallace who used the methods he'd used to investigate cold case murders to investigate the resurrection of Jesus. And they all came to that same conclusion that it actually happened. So returning to our passage, the resurrection of Jesus is at the heart of our faith. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile and we're still in our sins, says Paul. And the Gospels all lead to the climax of the resurrection. None of them stops at the crucifixion, but they all go on to record the resurrection of Jesus. The Apostles all emphasise the fact of resurrection and many died for doing so. If the resurrection of Jesus did not happen, the whole New Testament is a lie. An encounter with the living Christ turned the unbelieving Pharisee Saul of Tarsus into Christianity's greatest evangelist and teacher. And over the last 2000 years, it's continued to transform lives and is still doing so today. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. And if you think you're too bad to be accepted by Jesus, or somebody you know is too bad to be accepted by him, remember that if God would show mercy to that scheming Pharisee, Saul of Tarsus, nobody is beyond the scope of his saving grace. Amen. Absolutely no one is beyond God's saving grace. Thank you, David, for, for that message tonight. Uh, should we pray? Mighty God, we thank you for the reality and the repercussions of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that for sure he did die and he made it abundantly clear um, from history. We, we know that the church started and something changed people's lives and it was meeting with you. Having we known you've died and seen you alive again that lives were transformed to the point of being willing to go to their deaths themselves. But Lord, we thank you for, as we heard earlier on, it shows a number of things. It shows that your saving work is complete, that we can be forgiven and we can be free as we trust in your name. Thank you that it shows that you love us even when we mess up, however we mess up. Nothing is beyond your forgiveness as we ask your forgiveness and we look back to you, Jesus. 
choose to fix our eyes on you. So thank you that it points towards the truth of Jesus' other claims. But because he claimed to um, that he was going to die and rise again, and he, he believed, clearly pulled it off, that we can have confidence that he really is also the saviour of the world, as he claimed to be the son of God, the author of life, the, the only way to heaven. Thank you also that it proves that death is not the end. And that, yes, we can enjoy life in this world, not an easy life, but a fulfilled life. And we can look forward one day to eternal life. Thank you, God, for the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. In whose name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for listening tonight. And um, do go back and, and listen to previous messages from this series in 1 Corinthians um, generally audio messages in the evenings and also um, obviously all our morning service videos are online as well so do check those out as well if there's any that you've missed in the past if you're local we'd love you to join us in the building we've got a special service or two special services next sunday 9 30 in the morning 11 30 in the morning as well both of them baptism services um, so that it's going to be really amazing to be celebrating together. It's great that more people are, are, are venturing out. We're, we're playing it safe here. We're still socially distanced. Um, people are wearing masks as they're singing. We've got a very um, large and well-ventilated building. So, um, you know, please do come along. Even if you haven't come along before, you'd be so welcome. God bless and hopefully see you soon. <laughs>